Hi, I am Mishko. Uh, I'm a CTO of uh, Builder.io. And uh, in the past, I've done this thing called Angular and AngularJS. Some of you might have heard about it. And now I'm working on this new crazy thing called Quick. And I want to talk to you today about it. And the thing I want to convince you after the talk today is that Quick is very, very different. You, um, if you've used other frameworks, you should be looking at Quick and going like, what just happened? And if you don't have that moment, then I feel like I failed. Uh, but before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Builder.io. Um, Builder.io is a headless visual CMS. Um, what that is is uh, basically, you know Wix, right? People know Wix? OK, it's like Wix with one major difference. Wix has to be hosted with Wix, right? And you can't really have your application on Wix. You only can have the static content that Wix has. Builder.io is something you do NPM install into your existing React, Vue, Angular, Svelte, whatever application you happen to have. And then you can give your marketing team a headless visual drag and drop editor for the components that you as an engineer have built up. So it's kind of a cool thing. Now, we do a couple of other cool things besides Quick. We do this thing called Party Town and Mitosis. Party Town is a, uh, a, a library that takes your third party code like Google Analytics, Facebook Pixel, um, or any other like uh, code that runs on your homepage and it's messing up your performance course and moves that code over to the web worker, leaving the main thread free for your application to make sure you have a better performance. Um, we also have this other thing called Mitosis. Mitosis allows you to write UI components once, and it will generate idiomatic code for Angular, Vue, Svelte, Solid, Quick, whatever the output you want to have, uh, it will be generated out there. And it's not a wrapper around web components. It's an actual idiomatic code uh, that gets generated. OK, so I want to. Um, I want to convince you of something which I think should be self-obvious, and that is that core web vitals matter. You know what core web vitals are? So, some of you. So Google basically has instrumented Chrome, and Chrome sends back to Google anonymous data about what the experience of the user was on that particular website. And this data is aggregated in core web vitals, and you can basically navigate to whatever website you want, and it will tell you what, uh, if it's a good performance or not. Now, Google actually uses this information in uh, SEO optimization. So if somebody searches for sneakers, and there are two stores that um, sell the same thing that could be a possible hit, uh, Google will prioritize the one that has a better performance. It also makes sense from a user's point of view, because as a user, if I come to your website and I want to push the Buy button, and the buy button isn't working. I'm sure you had this experience, right? You navigate to a page, and there's a button you want to click, and it takes like 30 seconds before you can click on it, especially on mobile, right? Like things are happening, pop-ups are coming up, and all kinds of stuff. And that's basically hydration. And so uh, most websites, if you kind of go and look on the, uh, on the world, most websites kind of fail the core web vitals because all of our existing frameworks have this thing called hydration. How many people have heard of hydration? OK. Hydration is basically the equivalent of booting up your computer when you navigate to a website. You come to a website, and the browser, the, the code inside of the browser basically says, oh my gosh, I have to download the framework, the application, the code, and then I have to execute, you know, start out the root component, and then visit every single component that's on the page to figure out what is the component boundary, what, are, what is the state for this particular component, and most importantly, if there are any listeners attached to this particular component. And this boot up process is what we call hydration. And I'm going to argue that hydration is extremely expensive to start with. And the second uh, point I'm going to make is that it has to do with how complicated your application is. So you build a Hello World application, and you look at the performance scores, and you go like, this performs amazingly. Well, of course it performs amazingly. You don't have a lot of components yet, right? But then as you go to production, you need all kinds of components, A-B testing, cookies, tracking, you know, uh, personalization. You add all of that stuff in, and all of a sudden your, your demo Hello World website is no longer 50 kilobytes, is now 800 kilobytes, and now the performance just went down the drain. And there is very little you can do as a developer to make the situation better. Because the framework fundamentally says, I need this information, and therefore it will go and try to execute all of your code. 
So I want to show you a couple of, um, so there's this thing called Core Web Vitals, right? So which we kind of talk about. And there's this website where you can go and it actually compares uh, what the Core Web Vitals is for different technologies. So here you go, you, this, this shows Origins having a good Core Web Vitals score. And the first thing I want you to notice is the blue line. The blue line is across all domains, right? And you can see that it used to be pretty bad, and it kind of got a little better over here. And the reason it got better is because browsers got better, not because the technology has fundamentally changed, because this all represents all the technologies, right? And so it's not like all the technologies at the same time decided to get better. Instead, like, the browsers just got a little better. And so you can see that we kind of gotten better, and now we are in, uh, in you know, 40 percent range, which I will argue is still pretty bad. And then let's look at the light blue. The light blue is Next.js. Next.js is kind of the most common way of building websites. How many people have used Next.js? OK, good, good number of hands. And so what you can see is that Next.js doesn't actually perform that well. And the reason for that is because, well, Next.js is built on top of React, and React, um, as most other frameworks, have hydration. And because it has hydration, it has a huge uh, impact for performance. And the other thing I want to show you is uh, this purple line. This is Astro. And notice that it's much, much higher, and it's, uh, you know, it's about 65%. And the other line I want to show you is this yellow or orange line, which is quick, and also it's about 60% uh, in here. And so we're going to dive into quick in a second, but I want to just give you the background. Now, the line that I find super interesting is Remix. How many people have heard of Remix? OK. So Remix came out, and they basically said, look how much better we are than Next.js. And then their argument was basically this graph right here, saying, look, if you build a Remix website, it performs so much better than Next.js. Right? But here's something funny that you notice. Over time, the numbers have gone down. What happened? Well, if you look at this graph right here, this, is, uh, this shows the amount of JavaScript that's being downloaded per that technology. And so, of course, when the Remix first came out, there were very few websites built on it, and those websites were still new, and so they didn't have a lot of functionality. But as uh, people started adding functionality, notice the orange line is going up. And as you're adding functionality, the amount of code that the browser has to download and execute is going up. And because this is going up, notice this line over here is going down. Right? And so my argument is very simple. And that is, the site performance is proportional, or rather inversely proportional, to the amount of JavaScript you have to execute on startup. And this shouldn't be a surprise, right? The fastest way to build a website is just pure HTML and pure CSS. Nothing's faster than that, right? I think we can all agree on that, right? And so the trick is, how do I build a website with just pure HTML and CSS, but at the same time have interactivity? Right? The reason why we need interactivity is because, well, who wants to have a boring website that there is no interactivity? As users, we are used to certain quality and certain interactivity of our sites, and so if you create a website with no interactivity, that's not going to go very well. Right? And so I'm not here to tell you, stop writing JavaScript. That's unreasonable. Instead, I'm here to tell you that there is a better way to write JavaScript so that we don't overwhelm the browser with all of this JavaScript, and then, as a result, have these, poor, these poorly performing websites. Um, let's see, what else I wanted to say about this? I think I, think I covered that. Okay, so let's talk about Quick. Um, okay, let me, so I built a, a little mock page over here, and the thing I'm going to try to show you is, right now this is a, this page doesn't do anything. It just shows mock data. And so we're going to try to do a couple of things. We're going to try to load data from the database, and we're going to try to have some interactivity on this particular page. Now, the first thing I want to, I want to show you is, if I make this a little bigger, I want to show you the network tab. And currently, we're in a dev mode. And in the dev mode, um, uh, there's Vite, and Vite pushes some JavaScript into the page so that we do hot module reloading. So I filter this out. I'm, I'm going to say, like, pretend Vite doesn't exist here. What I want to show you here is that there is no JavaScript here. But actually, there are buttons. So this is a button. And if I click on it, 
you can see that this button actually does something because it, it has uh, printed stuff on the console, and this also is button, right? So if I go back to the network tab and I refresh this, there's no JavaScript, and then when I go and interact with something, the JavaScript shows up, right? So the difference here is that the way most websites become interactive is they say, let's download all the JavaScript, let's execute all the JavaScript, and then you can be interactive, right? What Click is doing is the exact opposite. It says, actually, let's not download any JavaScript, and it's only when the user goes and interacts with something, then we will download JavaScript. Now, the first thing we have to address is the fact that hydration takes multiple seconds. And so, wouldn't that mean that the first time I interact with something, I will have to wait multiples worth of seconds, okay? And so this is where uh, Quick has something called resumability. And the resumability basically says this. You executed the application on a server. On a server, the application was running, and we collected all the data we needed to know, right? We collected the information about where the component boundaries are. We know what the state of the system was. We know where the listener was. But then we serialized that application into the HTML. And in the process of serializing, we kind of lost all that information. You just ended up with pure HTML. But what Click does is, is in the process of serializing the HTML, it stores all that information. So let me show you this, for example. Let's look at this button here. And you see that this button says on click. There is an attribute in the DOM that says, hey, you can click on this, right? So for Quick to become interactive, it doesn't have to download your application and execute all of it. It can just look at the DOM and be like, oh, there's a click listener right here, right? There's nothing I have to do. And so what this click listener basically says is it says, okay, so this is the piece of code that you need to download. And inside of this piece of code, there's a function that's being exported right here. And that's the function I want you to, to execute, right? So let me refresh this again. If I go to the network tab and I click on this button, notice what shows up. The only code that shows up is the code associated with what had to happen, right? Just the console log, nothing else, right? Let's go back to, to the source code here. Let me just make this bigger. How's that on font? Is that a good font? Okay, so notice we had a favorite click and we said console log favorite click, right? So this is inside of a component. And oh, by the way, there are other components above me and below me. There is the layout component. There is the component that worries about the header of the page, et cetera, other things. There's maybe about 30 different components on the page uh, right now. But out of all those things, Quick was able to download just the console log because that's the only thing you need to process that click, right? The second thing that downloaded is the framework itself, and then there's this build file that disappears when you do a proper build. And so a quick application, so here's another example, is, um, you know, it downloads just the code that's needed, right? We don't download all of the code all at once. We just download the code that you're interacting with, right? So now imagine you have a big website that uses, for example, you're buying shoes, right? You come to like Amazon. Um, if you click on a buy button, the only code that should download is just the listener for the buy button, and then it probably goes and updates the shopping cart, and so we should download the shopping cart and update that. But the fact that there's menu system, I shouldn't have to download the code associated with the menu system, right? I shouldn't have to download the code associated with um, the comment sections that people do reviews, et cetera, at the bottom. All the other stuff on the page, there's a lot of code on a page. Like, none of that stuff is needed when I click on a shopping cart button. And so I shouldn't have to download anything of that. Now, the thing I want to show you is that how many people are React developers? Okay, so if you're a React developer and you look at this, you should feel very, very familiar with this thing. You know, instead of use store, uh, sorry, state, you have use signal, uh, you know, we have our listeners, we have our JSX uh, that renders the output. This is very, very familiar, and this is intentional. Like, we intentionally made it, so it's very familiar. But the thing I want to show you is it doesn't work like anything you've seen before, because um, how in the world is the system supposed to download just this? This is a function that is buried inside of a component, right? How do you get a hold of that function uh, from, from the outside? And so Quick has this, this magical thing we call dollar signs. We call this code extraction. 
And everywhere you put a dollar sign, you're basically telling the system like, I want you to be able to lazy load this piece of code. Right? So if you don't interact with that listener, don't download it. Now in this particular case, all we're doing is uh, printing out console log. And so because all we're doing is printing out console log, there is no need to even download the component. The component never makes it to the client. So if I go ahead and say console.log render, right? The, the render bit shows up on a server, but it will never show up on the client. I can go and interact with the page, but it never says render on the client. Right? Because you don't need it. The component wasn't rendering. Why would you download a piece of code that you don't need? That is not how other frameworks work. And I'm hope you're kind of starting to understand, like, this is not how the rest of the world works. The rest of the world basically downloads everything, and then, uh, you know, if you, if you download too much, the people will say, go and do lazy loading. Uh, except that you can't really do lazy loading for component that is on the page. You can only do lazy loading for components that are not currently on a page. If a component is on a page, can't do lazy loading, which means that the amount of code you download is proportional to the, all the components that are on that page that you want to show. Whereas in Quick, you're really only downloading the amount of code that's needed for that specific interaction. Now, I know what you're thinking. Now you're thinking like, okay, well, doesn't it mean that when I go and, you know, like I come here and uh, I come to a particular location and I want to go and interact with it, that means I have to download a whole bunch of code. Doesn't it mean that if I'm on a slow network or maybe if I go to a tunnel, all of a sudden my application doesn't work? Or uh, I'll just have to wait a long time for the first rendering? And so what I want to show you is that that's not the case. And for that, let's go to, actually, let's go back here. Uh, so this is a new incognito window, right? And I want to go to the network tab, and I'm going to go and navigate uh, to our website. So this is a production application, right? And I'm going to navigate to the website, and the first thing I'm going to do as soon as the website loads is I'm going to go and I'm going to say go offline. So I've entered the tunnel, right? And once I enter the tunnel, uh, I'm going to go, let's, let's clear the network tab, and I'm going to go and start interacting with the page. Notice, obviously it doesn't work because I'm in a tunnel, but the code associated with that for interactivity has downloaded. Not only has it downloaded, if you look at the times here, oh, it's hard to show because it's, the font is too big. Notice these times are super small. That's because there is a service worker that has prefetched all of the code that's necessary and placed it in a browser cache. So uh, if I go to the application, and if I go to the cache, all the code that was needed to run the application was prefetched. So what's happening is that the main thread where the V8 is running doesn't get any code. But in a separate thread, we start prefetching all the code. Now, I really want to stress this. There is a huge difference between downloading code and executing code. Right? We're not executing any code. We're just downloading it into the cache. Right? And um, the second point I want to make is that you would think that the code we download is equivalent to a normal hydration-based application. But that's not the case. We are only downloading a small subset of things because not every component that's on your page will actually re-render. Right? Many of the components are static and they will never re-render. And as a result, uh, you don't have to download any of this stuff. Now, uh, now that we have this, so, so you have a service worker that goes and loads this, and so the end result is that if I go to the network tab, I can go and interact with the application even though the network is not there, and more importantly, any interactions I will have will be instantaneous because I really don't have to wait for the network uh, to download. Now, I want to show you something else, which is um, how do we know what to download? And so there are a set of heuristics in the system that naturally try to figure out like what the reasonable starting point of the application is. But the heuristics only go so far. At some point, uh, you won't be able to do that. So instead, what Quick comes with is something called a Quick Insights. So Quick Insights, basically, when your application is running in production, it collects all the information about which functions were needed and when, 
and ships it into this uh, service called Quick Insights. Um, you can host the service yourself if you don't trust us. Uh, but more importantly, we build this, this matrix. And what this matrix shows that if you need this function which has a particular hash, if you need that function, there's 80% of chance that you're also going to need this other function. Right? And notice most of the page here is empty, uh, meaning that most of the time you actually won't need anything else. And what this information allows you to do is create idealized bundles. So what the system is basically saying is, look, I want you to create this bundle because I've noticed from running real behavior applications is that um, when the users actually use the application, they need all of these things together, which kind of makes sense, right? Because if I go and navigate to, uh, to here and I click search, right, and I start typing, there are many components that are involved in running this. And so there's many functions that I need and I don't want to have to fetch every single one separately. So this bit right here, sorry, this bit right here, basically says how to put them together. So this avoids waterfalls, right? So you can put everything that's related in the same file. Now, once you get all these bundles, the second thing you do is you say for a particular route, which functions are needed and how long since the person navigated to the page, right? If there's a buy button and everybody clicks on it, all of your users click on this buy button, you want to make sure you prefetch code associated with the buy button first, right? And if there's another button somewhere on the corner that says contact customer support and most of your users do not click on that button, then you should download the code associated with that last, right? Um, and so this information here is, is uh, used to prioritize the order of the bundles so that you know to download the first bundle, the second bundle, the third bundle, and so on and so forth. Now I'm going to pause here and basically say, um, I'm sure you've built many frameworks, but I'm going to say that none of the frameworks you ever build has anything like this, right? This is very unique. And, and the fundamental reason why nobody has this is because let's say you want to lazy load something in your existing framework. What do you have to do? Well, uh, you as a developer have to figure out where I'm going to put the dynamic import, right? I have to go to my code base and I have to refactor my code base in a way where I can insert dynamic imports. The second problem is, that you can't just lazy load a listener, you really can only lazy load a component. And there's a funny thing which happens, which is most of the times, um, you either need to render the component or you need to interact with a listener. You rarely need to do both. So why are we forced to download both of them together? Right? I will argue that if you look at a page like an Amazon website, vast majority of the components are static components. They will never re-render. You don't need their code. But at the same time, there are many places where you can interact. And so all the places where you can interact are the listeners that you have to download. So you don't really want to be able to download the listener independently from the component itself. So uh, I, I really go on to this side note of this quick insights because people almost always say, oh, doesn't that mean that everything is slow? And I want to convince you that with Quick, things are not slow. We've done all these things so that we automatically can do this. Oh, yeah, and so to go back to the previous point, um, in normally, you have to, as a developer, you have to put dynamic imports inside of your code base. And um, the places where you put a dynamic import will have an impact on the performance of the application. If you put it in the wrong place, and you're dynamically importing something that is needed eagerly, you're making the situation worse. On the other hand, if you don't put it somewhere, you're downloading too much. And oh, by the way, dehydration will kind of force you to download many things anyways. The important thing to understand with Quick is that the lazy loading is configuration level information, right? To change the way bundles are done, it is not I have to go refactor my code. It's just I have to configure the bundler in a different way. And that's, that's super important because um, lazy loading optimization in existing systems can only be done by refactoring the application, which means you cannot have you know, some automated system like this do this for you. Whereas in, in Quick, you don't do any kind of special stuff. You just write your component. And the component forces you to write, put these dollar signs everywhere, right? It goes here, here's our on-click, there's a dollar sign, right? 
And if I don't put it in, uh, it's not like it's going to let me. It's going to complain, saying, like, there's no such thing. I was supposed to start a timer, and I forgot. So I don't know how far in I am. OK, so now that I kind of convinced you, hopefully I convinced you, that quick is different, let's make something actually happen. So let's say, um, if, you, if you go to this particular page, where are we? Where are we? Here we go. OK, um, we have some Mac today. Oh, before we get started, I want to show you a common problem with frameworks. So a common problem with frameworks is that we uh, don't put, we don't optimize images. And notice what happens in Quick. It's complaining and it's putting this thing over here saying like, hey, this image here has caused a layout shift. This is going to be a problem in production. Right? It's telling you this immediately in a dev mode, saying, like, this is going to be a problem. You need to do something about it. Um, and the reason for that is because this thing doesn't have width and height. Right? It's basically complaining about it. But not only is it complaining here, it is also complaining in your source code, saying, like, hey, um, this is going to be a problem. You have an image, and you don't have width and height. But here's the best part. Notice what it says right now, image source uh, m heavy JPEG. Watch this. I'm going to click autofix. Let's go to the source code. Notice it replaced it with a component. This component got uh, imported from, from a special location. And now, if you go here, if I go to this particular component, uh, okay, let's go, let's go to the component right here. You'll see that this image now has a source set for different sizes. So image optimization out of the box with a single click. Pretty nice, huh? OK, but let's make this thing actually do something useful. So uh, currently, it just has mock data. And let's say we want to load it. So um, I've created, uh, this is a file-based routing. So just if you're familiar with uh, any file-based routing systems like Next.js, you should be familiar. I created a folder called full stack and a court ID inside of the brackets. And so now inside of the index TSX, I would like to um, perform the loading of the data. So uh, let's see what I'm doing on time. 920. OK, so I'm going to be cheating a little bit. So let's load data. So data loading is here. OK, so I've pasted a piece of code that says it's a route loader. And what is inside of the route loader is running on a server. Even though it's a single file where we have server, uh, uh, we can mix server and client code, uh, this code right here is going to be running in a server. This is a component. And if you think about it, components actually in this case, because it's SSR, will run on a server as well. But the click listener doesn't run on the server, right? The click listener runs on the client. And so you end up in this world where you can mix and match server and client stuff. Um, and to some degree, you can do this in Next.js with get server props. But I'm going to show you how this bit is better. So uh, we have a route loader. We get params, right? So the params is the quote ID from here. So params quote ID will say whatever the URL happens to be. I'm going to talk to the database to load my stuff. Uh, if um, the database doesn't get the things I need, I am going to uh, respond with 400. So let's say. If I go to and do whatever, put something that clearly is not in the database, I'll get a not found, right? So notice, not only can I um, mix client server code in the same, same file, I can also do um, uh, middleware, right? I can decide, I can redirect, I can uh, do four ones, return JSON, and all kinds of different choices that you, you might want to do. Um, and so now that I have this, this is a use method. So I can, instead of um, getting the quote by creating a mock value over here, I can just say use, oops, use method like this. Now the advantage of having a use method like this is that I can have any number of route loaders. In, in Next.js, you can only have one get server prop, and that one get server prop has to be in the same file as your component, and that get server prop provides properties for your root component. But in this case, the I can have as many route loader files as I want, one. Number two, they can be in different files. I can put a route loader, for example, for currently logged in session, for the currently logged in user inside of the layout, and I can use that information uh, in my component. So it becomes composable. 
And the last cool thing about it is that notice the type information automatically flows. I know that what I'm getting here is a read-only signal of a quote, right? So that gets sent to the other side. Um, and so now when I go and visit my page, notice instead of having static data, I actually have useful data that's being loaded. Now, if you did this in Next.js, Next.js has this thing called underscore underscore next data, right? That's where all of this data is stored because, well, Next.js app will do hydration and during hydration, the component will need the data again to re-render what's already on the page. So we have something similar and it's called the quick JSON. But notice in this particular case, it didn't get serialized. The reason it didn't get serialized is because system understood the fact that this component can never ever re-render on the client. And because it can never render on the client, why would I serialize the data that the component needs? The component doesn't need its data, so don't serialize it, right? So not only can we not execute code, we can also not send unnecessary data to the client. Okay, let's um, do the next uh, step, which is let's make uh, these, these buttons actually do something useful. Uh, so, Clicking on a button, like you see over here, we should be able to, uh, you know, route loader gets me data from the server to the client. Now I want to do the opposite, right? I want to get data from the client to the server. And so for that, we use something, a form action. So let me copy this over. And let me just get rid of the delay for a second. Um, okay, so a form action, again, runs on a server. And, you know, again, we'll talk to the database and do whatever you need to do. And so let's use it. So in the client, I'm going to say, and again, you can have as many form actions you want in your application and they compose. Uh, yep, that's, that's pretty good. Okay. And so now that we have this, um, favorite client, let's see, uh, let's submit. Uh, but we have to submit some data in here, no? Oh, no, because that just toggles. Okay, right, right, right. That just toggles. So now, this button right here will toggle, right? Because in the client, right? So, so again, let's look at the network tab. Let's clear this. In a client, when I click this button, uh, we will download um, the favorite clicked, and then we will call a method. So this method does an RPC, you know, a form post to the server, uh, extra code downloads for all these stuff. This extra code, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, individual files because we're in a dev mode. In production, all of them will be squashed together into a single file, right? Um, on a server, we, uh, we update the database and then we rerun the loader. And because we rerun the loader, we can then go and re-update, uh, you know, re-update the data. So the updating of the data and the numbers, as you can see, 232, 331, we didn't have to do any special code. Because new data shows up from the server, uh, it just updates. And in this particular case, if I go to the elements, because re-rendering can happen in the client all of a sudden, notice the amount of data we're serializing is much bigger, right? Because now the system understands that, like, hey, you know, if you interact with the data, I will have to re-render, and because I'm going to have to re-render, I'm going to have to serialize the data in the client. So the amount of data that's serialized is dependent on what kind of interactions you happen to have in this particular uh, case. So the route loader and route actions are kind of the preferred way of talking to the server, but I want to show you a different way of talking to the server. Uh, okay. So this second button, which is a star click, uh, will do a couple of things. First of all, we will update the uh, rating value. We will take it and we will, uh, you know, just every time you click on the stars, we'll increment them by one. And if we overflow, we go to the beginning, right? So we're just going to update the state. And we have this special function called server dollar. Whatever we wrapped inside of the server dollar, that function will be running on a server. So even though we're in a client, we can make an RPC call to the server and perform some operation on a server. And so just by wrapping a closure, a, a function inside a server dollar, we can now execute code on a server. 
And you know, on a server, we pass in, notice, we pass in quote and ratings. These things are data that exists on a client. So the, the bizarre thing, which is kind of hard to explain, that Quick knows how to do, is Quick knows how to make a function in one VM, like on a server or on a client, you instantiate the function. The function closes over a bunch of variables, and then we know how to move that closure to the other VM and execute it on the other VM. Which, if you think about it, that's kind of crazy, right? Right? So what's happening here, whoa, sorry. What's happening here, where is this? Where am I? Okay, here we go. So this function runs on the client, and then it updates the client state, and then server dollar executes on a server to talk to the database, right? I can't put this code on the client. That's not gonna work. Like, I can't have database code on, a, on the client. That, that just isn't gonna work. So now we have code that goes and updates the number of stars, and then you can see that if I go to the XHR, let's refresh this, when I click, I'm essentially doing a post to a particular URL, in this post, I am basically telling the system like what data should be executed, and somewhere in here, it should also talk about what is the ID. Oh yeah, so the function ID is in the URL right here. That's how the server knows what function to run on the other side. And I really wanna make this clear. Even though it looks like we're sending code between client and the server, uh, actually we can only do this with code that existed at the time of compilation. Right? So you can't just like inject code into your system and like somehow trick the client to send some function to the server that the, the, the server doesn't expect. Server can only run functions that it, it ex the functions which existed at the time of the compilation. Right? If a function didn't exist, sorry, it can't be run. So from a security point of view, um, this looks like a, a scary thing, but actually uh, it, you can't really inject stuff that you don't want. And so now you, you get this thing over here. Now, I think I'm running out of time, so I want to flip over and I give you a different demo. And I really want to uh, kind of drive this demo home. Okay, uh, some of you, well, may, let's make the font bigger. Some of you might know about this API called the watch. This is in Node.js, right? This has nothing to do with Quick. Okay, so this is a watch API. And what the watch API does is that you can, when you call it and you give it a file path, it will tell you whenever any file on the file system changes, right? And I, I want, let's say I want to call this API uh, in my application. Let's say I want to watch the file system, right? So I made a, um, a second demo, and all this demo has is a button that says watch, and um, if I click on this button, all, all I'm gonna do is says watching true, and then, of course, I have a little bit of JSX that shows it. And then I have these files, which is going to represent uh, just basically your console log, right? And so what I want to do is I want to be able to say, if I click Start, and if I go to a file system like this, and if I touch a file, if I can type, right, I want this file name to show up in the client. So the way you do this in Node.js is they give you this nice example right here. It says like, okay, this is how you do it. You do something called for await watcher, right? So uh, let's see, we're inside a click and I'm gonna do this. What just happened? No, no, wait, 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 wait. This is the wrong file. No. Uh, there we go. Okay, so. Oh, it is so hard to type when people are watching you, just so you know. Okay, what I wanna do is I wanna do watch on the current file system, right? But um, this isn't gonna work because watch is a node API. This is a click listener that's on the client, right? So what we really wanna do is we wanna do this on a server. So now on a server, I want to execute the watch. Oh yeah, it and has a second argument. Curse, recurse, true. Why are you complaining now? Server, watch, what did I do wrong? Okay. Uh, No, 
No, because it's the function I want to uh, port, and then I want to call the function separately. Hold on. Let me uh, let me cheat chew, chew, uh, chew, uh, cheat over here. Uh, what is the thing here? Uh, this is solution. Yeah. Use signal. Oh no, the solution doesn't have a solution. Oh, that's long, lovely. All right. Let's see. Um, promise. Oh yeah. Of course. Await. Okay. And what's what are you complaining about? Recurse. Recursive. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now that we have the event, we should be able to say files push uh, event file name. And all oh, right, because you could be uh, something other. Okay. So we can push it to the list of strings on the client. And so now when I go here and I hit watch and I go to the console and I touch a file, it shows up on the client. Okay. Your brains should be exploding right now. <laughs> okay. This is what I mean by a unified client server architecture, right? Like, if you think about it, we call ourselves full stack developers. But are we really full stack developers? There's really a server and there's really a client. And the two shall never mix, right? But in the world of Quick, because we can like move functions around and do this crazy insanity, um, it becomes a lot more muddier about like where does the code run. And I know it sounds scary because it's new, but if you use this for a while, it becomes very refreshing because you don't think of your application as, oh, I'm running on a server, I'm running on the client. You just think of it like, I'm running the application. And it just runs where it needs to to get the right stuff down. So um, I could show many, many other cool things, but I'm sure you have questions. So I'm going to open up to questions. Nobody? Your brains are not working at this point. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so let's, let's uh, kind of dive deeper into it. Okay, good, good question. Um, so the question is, how much is the overhead of kind of getting the system going? So there's two parts. There's a service worker and there's this other thing called the quick loader. So um, if I go and click, look at this watch thing, do you see this button on the, has an on click, right? And this on click, is, is, it's not a standard. Like browsers don't know what this is, right? So this won't work. You need additional piece of code. And so there is a piece of code called a quick loader. Uh, this quick loader is about a kilobyte worth of JavaScript, and we actually inline it into the page. And this quick loader uh, executes on about a millisecond on a desktop, maybe 10 milliseconds on the client. And then also notice over here, there is this push called the click, right? So this tells the quick loader that uh, you need to listen to click events. And so when I go and click on this button, the event bubbles up, right? It goes all the way up. And a quick loader kind of uh, intercepts it, and then the quick loader can go and look at the DOM and see if there is a on-click button and downloads it. So it's not zero JavaScript, but it's pretty that close to it. The second piece of code that you have is the service worker. And this is a dev mode, so it's not going to show up here. So let's go to production. Uh, and a service worker is somewhere. Um, it's a quick loader. So, so there is a list of things to prefetch. Uh, okay, I don't know where it is. Somewhere in here, there's a script tag that loads the, 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 the quick loader, so the, the service worker. Now, the service worker is a separate thread, and I think this is worth pointing out. Uh, it is, I don't know how big it is. It's, it's proportional to the size of, um, of the routes because the, the quick loader, the, the service worker, which is right here. No, that's not a service worker. That's party town. It's the wrong thing. Um, this is where it is, right here. The service worker on the top has basically graph of all of the code. So the service worker understands the relationship between which code is importing which other code. So if you say, I want a particular symbol, the service worker understands that, like, okay, so this symbol comes from this file. But this file imports these other files, so I have to make sure to make sure that all of these things are inside of the, the browser's cache. 
And the way, so this is definitely not, I don't know how big this file is. I guess it depends on how, how many routes you have, etc. So this might be several kilobytes. But it is running in a separate thread. And because it's running in a separate thread, it has no impact on the main thread, right? It won't negatively impact. If you think about it, all modern devices, you know, your, your phones, have multiple, multiple cores. So they can do things concurrently. But the problem is JavaScript is single-threaded. But a service worker is a separate thread. So yes, you are doing more work, but it's on a thread which doesn't affect the main thread. And because it doesn't affect the main thread, there's no penalty to it, right? So you just kind of download all the code in the background um, so that you can uh, do it this particular way. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. So the way this works is that as part of your build process, when you make a production build, the build steps will go and talk to Quick Insights and fetch the latest statistical data. And using that data, they will then configure the, the bundler to make sure that only the right pieces of code are downloaded. Oh, and you reminded me, I wanted to show you one more cool demo. Uh, I wanted to show you what happens if you, I'm going to download a clock, and of course, it will never be the right clock. Hold on. Uh, clock. Okay, so here's a clock. Refresh the page. Okay, no, wrong clock. Oh. Here's a clock in here, right? When this clock loads in the network, you will see that, let's go to JavaScript, that code shows up eagerly. It has to because this clock updates every one second, right? But what if I have a div here, and this is a style which has height 100 VH. Now the clock is below the fold. Notice no JavaScript shows up. You scroll it into the view, JavaScript shows up. Do that in your framework. Sorry, back to the question. Thank you. You know what? I appreciate that. I, I work for applause. The bundler, OK. Um, so this is written on top of, this is running all on top of Vite. Uh, Vite is amazing. You, sh you should use Vite. Uh, Vite uses rollup underneath it. Uh, so really, we're just using rollup. But there is a piece of code we have written called the optimizer. And the job of the optimizer is to look for these dollar signs and perform the transformation of the code. Now, what's cool about this is that the optimizer is unaware of quick. So it's not like the optimizer knows that there's a component dollar. No, the optimizer just looks for the dollar sign, right? So you can make your own functions that have this particular behavior of lazy loading, right? And so one thing you never have to do in a quick application is to think about how lazy loading should happen, right? You as a developer just write your application. And out of the box, you will get all of this stuff in there. Anything else I can answer? I think we're out of time, but I'm happy to answer. Oh, by the way, I do have quick stickers, if you would like. All right, thank you. <laughs>